Welcome back, uh, Star Trek fans and podcast aficionados. Uh, just a little bit of sad news before we start the uh, the podcast regular this week. Um, this is probably going to be old news by the time we uh, we go out, but at time of recording, we've just received the sad news today that uh, that the Trek community has lost a bit of a shining light. Um, Kenneth Mitchell. Uh, the episode we're reviewing today is a Discovery episode, and we really couldn't talk about Discovery without at least addressing uh, Kenneth Mitchell because when they come to write the story of Discovery it won't be possible to write it without him. He was such a huge part of the show. Uh, if you don't know, he played uh, several characters in Discovery. Uh, the Klingons, Call in the first season, Call Shah in the second season, uh, Tanavik in the second season as well, and uh, also the character Aurelio, uh, which incorporated his uh, his disability in the late third season. Uh, he also did a few voices on Star Trek Lower Decks and various things uh, along those lines and was just basically a, a shining light in the community, even when uh, when diagnosed with uh, with ALS, sometimes known as Lou Gehrig's disease. He still uh, carried battling on for his kids and for the, the fandom and was always just a, a light, I think, when, whenever we saw sort of events and conventions and stuff. And I think I, for one, as a fan, wanted to say I really appreciate everything that he contributed to the franchise. And it's tragic, it's horrible, um, but, you know, there's a legacy there that will hopefully live on not just of great work but of love uh, with the family members who survive uh, him and yeah it's a very sad time and I hope we all can uh, can celebrate the work and can also say rest in peace. Uh, I'm here with uh, with DK and with Jordan. Uh, DK did you have something you wanted to quickly add to that? Yeah it's, it's just one of those one of those character actors that are involved in Star Trek and you never never heard a bad word with uh, with regards to him. I did love his turn as Aurelio, uh, but also point out as you know, being a geek, he also played Joseph uh, Danvers in Captain Marvel. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be much missed. Definitely, and Jordan, you're the resident sort of Discovery super fan, so uh, we kind of have to get some input from you. I think. Yeah, it's impossible to imagine Discovery without him. Um, both the the show itself and the community. Um, I'm also just thinking there are a lot of folks on the Star Trek cruise right now. Um, and he was on the Star Trek cruise many times, um, usually with his House of Cold dance party that would go until mm. 3 or 4 a.m. I've never been on the cruise, but this is what I've heard. Um, and so just thinking about about that as well and his his legacy in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Just a giant of a man in uh, both mm -hmm. physically and I think just in in terms of impact. And uh, I will say, if if you're unfamiliar on a geeky level, uh, something that really touched me when I learned that um, there's actually a starship named after him in Discovery, the USS Mitchell, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, is mentioned and appears in season four of Discovery. So that's always a little bit of a, a nice tribute. I know we have one for the um, the USS Nog for Aaron already in Discovery. So yeah kind of a nice tribute and it's nice that he got a chance to see that i think before uh, before passing away so mm -hmm. yeah as i said it's going to be a, a sad loss but uh, we definitely have all that look to look that work to look back on and uh, i'm sure we'll be looking at some episodes and performances when we do come to talk about discovery later in the year do the full series review and talk about our favorite episodes but uh, yeah in the meantime obviously condolences go out to uh, to all of his friends and especially his family and uh, yeah rest in peace kenneth Mitchell. Personal log, supplemental. Even after a year of finding my way alone, I truly believed I could find a way to fit back into this uniform, onto this ship. Now I'm not so sure. I've become someone new, still just as committed to the Federation, to my friends. But there's a distance between us now. I know I'll never be at peace until I solve the burn, but I don't know if I can do it from discovery. This may not be my home anymore, and I don't know what that means, or where it will lead me. And hailing frequencies are once again open. Welcome back, podcast aficionados, Star Trek fans, Trekkies, Romulans, Vulcans. 
what's going on here <laughs> to a brand new review uh, here on the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast. Uh, today we are quite appropriately looking at the episode Unification 3 from Star Trek Discovery. Yes, we did look at Unification 1 and 2 last week, so logically we're going to look at Unification 3 this week. Yeah, <laughs> we're doing a kind of linked thing for the first few episodes this season. We did Balance of Terror, then Quality of Mercy, then we're doing all the unifications. So hopefully it's logical and it makes sense. Haha, -ha, logical. <laughs> Unintended pun. But uh, I couldn't do this by myself. I'm your regular host, Captain Mike Wilson, or Captain Michael Burnsham, this week. So <laughs> that was such a bad pun. I'm so sorry. No, I paused that was for genius. A... It was genius. <laughs> I paused for applause. Didn't get any and didn't deserve any. But <laughs> I, can't, uh, I can't do this alone. So I'm joined, as always, by my regular number one, DK. Hello, and welcome to DK's Torture Season. <laughs> you say that, but I've got a, I've got something to let the audience in on about a private message you sent. So we'll, uh, we'll get. Don't there you dare! <laughs> and we are joined because we're doing a discovery review. You won't be surprised to learn by discovery superfan making her return to the podcast after a few appearances. Please welcome back Jordan Lafordan. Come. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. As always. I feel really feel really bad because I always just keep referring to you as a Discovery super fan. Like, that's all you ever watch. You're, you're a huge fan of just Trek in general. It's just that, that's True. how we kind of knew each other. True. And uh, yeah. I often see you posting. So. I am very vocal <laughs> about my love for Discovery. So, Yes, absolutely. So we'll see uh, see how you think of this episode or if it happens to be an outlier, one of the, one of the ones, an outlier, sorry, one of the ones you don't particularly like. But, uh, yeah, we'll get there. But, we, you know, uh, if you are a regular listener to the podcast that we don't uh, – dive straight into the review we always start with little bits and pieces first uh beginning with a little bit of a get to know you and a little bit of a catch-up in the section that i rather geekily call healing frequencies open healing frequencies open sir so jordan as i say you have been on the podcast before so presumably we've asked you well i know we've asked you what your journey to star trek was mm -hmm. uh you know how you got involved where your name even comes from and bits and pieces like that and i highly recommend everybody check out our past appearances uh as i say i, I know you definitely uh, talked about this on the review we did of the picard episode assimilation mm -hmm. so uh, we've kind of got all that on record as it were but given that this season we are looking at romulan themed episodes much to dk's dismay at times <laughs> uh we <laughs> We have to ask you the uh, the relevant question for this theme and say, do you have any particular favorite Romulan episodes, stories, or characters that you that you wanted to shout out before we get into it? Um, well, I love Romulans in general. I love yes. their um, paranoia <laughs> and their pridefulness. I <laughs> I particularly love the TNG episode. Um, I believe it's called the Enemy mm -hmm. yep. with with Jordy. Um, I mean, if you can't tell by my name. Jordy LaForge is one of my favorite characters. Um, and hmm. I also like Eye of the Needle. No. Is it Eye of the Needle yeah. from Voyager? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just um, I get Eye of the Needle and Message in a Bottle, the titles of the episodes confused, so I'm glad I was right the first time. I just need to say it more oh, yeah. confidently. Um, I see. Yeah. That's yeah, understandable. No. Actually, Message in a Bottle would have made actually a good title for all of my <laughs> Right? That's why I get confused. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I of the Needle is one of my favorites as well. Um, and then I particularly, so in, individual characters. Oh, mm. sorry. Let me back up. I can't talk about characters without talking about my love for Star Trek Nemesis. Um, I know that that's somewhat controversial in the I'm not saying anything because we're looking at that in a few weeks <laughs> <laughs> um so I and so much of that is nostalgia for me I was just the right age when I first saw it um it was a huge rewatch for me you know those summer days when I had nothing else to do um okay. I would just you know put that on and um I love the score that's part of it too um but I love um Dinatra and mm -hmm. Dina oh. Mayer. You, of course you love Dinatra. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, oh, what is her name? Talara? I have no idea who that is. <laughs> I think she's also in Nemesis. But part of my love for, for her, I think that's her name, uh, those two is their appearances in the Star Trek novels as well. Ah, Everything cool. gets super fleshed out with them. Um, and I, I adore, I adore both of them. So those are two of my favorite Romulans. Um, That's fair enough. Well, 
regular listeners will know that we uh, we are fans of the Star Trek novels because by now uh, everyone will have heard our interview with David Mack talking about mm. his contributions to the various yes. things, uh, various non-canon as it were events and uh, and spin-offs. But uh, weirdly enough, uh, just, just as a random aside, I was almost going to put uh, Donatra on the hit or miss section for this week and didn't. Oh, so. <laughs> well, um, my answer would have been that she's a huge hit for me. So. There you go. <laughs> Yes. Like I say, any anytime I see Dina Mayer is a big hit. She's one of those actors that's a bit like Tim Curry, where you, you find where you know her from more or first, and then you can always pinpoint a person's kind of age and taste. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with with me, sadly, it was the TV show Birds of Prey. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, and you should be. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Starship Troopers or anything cool like that or whatever. It was, yeah, Birds of Prey. Ugh, but never mind. Still the best Batgirl, though, I'm telling you. And at least one of the ones Warner Brothers didn't can. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> it wasn't cancelled, you know, before it even aired. Yeah, exactly. Maybe it should have been, some would say. But anyway, that's <laughs> uh, very off topic for a Trek podcast. So, yeah, uh, that's some really good answers, actually, Jordan. I think uh, we aren't looking at the episode The Enemy, but it was a hard cut from this season mm. in favour of a different next-gen episode that's just a few episodes along from that in season three um, that we're going to be looking at. And, uh, yeah, as I say, we are looking at Ivan Needle. We're looking at Star Trek Nemesis, so... Yeah, is this uh, is this where I should drop to the audience the message that you sent me, DK? <laughs> do should... it, do it, do oh, it. Oh man, go on then, so go on. He's been bitching and moaning about doing these Romulan episodes because I was the one that picked the theme for like since he heard about it really. And I got a message the other day that just said, "I'm really hating doing these because, with the exception of like Sealer and some of the pantomime stuff last week, I'm actually really enjoying these episodes." <laughs> and I was like, "Yes." <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the dark side. <laughs> no, there is still there is still time for it to turn it around and me to go back to my uh, you know Mariner pop viewpoint. <laughs> yes, which Romulans are just shady, of course. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that's fair enough. I don't, don't think we really have anything else to ask. So uh, without further ado, I'll close the uh, the healing frequencies for now, and I will go to the section that gives the podcast its name, and that is the hit or miss section. What about my performance? I'm not a drama critic. So, uh, just uh, if you happen to be new here or you're listening to us in a new form, uh, the Hit or Miss section gives the podcast its name, as I said. And basically what it is, I pick uh, a few things at random. I've got five things this week because hopefully we'll have time. We'll see if uh, they all make the edit. Uh, So five things completely at random that my guest and co-host don't know about. I've just picked them and I will shoot them up on screen, uh, shout them out, and then we'll ask uh, if it's a hit or a miss. Uh, come, come to all three of us, see if we can come to a consensus debate if necessary. Uh, although it's all been very positive for the most part so far this series. Um, yeah, and uh, because obviously we're doing Romulan-themed episodes, there will be some Romulan-themed stuff mixed in there, but it won't be entirely just that because that would get boring and we want some other things to pop up in the hit or miss section. So, uh, yeah, without any further rambling from me then, are we both ready, DK and Jordan? Yeah. Yeah. The first thing is Romulan themed, and it is a ship because it's me. Uh, it's a ship that wasn't canon and was made canon. Uh, so hit or miss for the vertical Romulan to Derodex Warbird, which has now appeared in Lower Decks and is official. Uh, let's see. Jordan, you're the guest. We'll come to you first. Uh, it's a miss for me, which very few things are a miss for wow. me. But I... <laughs> I prefer the horizontal warbird. So wow, okay, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it just doesn't. I don't like it. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Just aesthetically, you're not a fan, and you're more used to the uh, the horizontal, obviously. So that's fair enough. Well, um, DK, then we'll come to you before I uh, let the audience know the kind of backstory of this one. (laughs) Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned it wasn't canon. I'm I'm presuming this was the last season of Lower Decks. Is that right? You probably haven't seen it because yes, it was in the previous yeah. season. No, I did, I did, I did see, I did see this one. It's I don't know. It just seems kind of out of place with Romulan design. I get where they're coming from. Uh, it's I don't hate it. It's mm. a soft miss for me. And if you know, if I do remember rightly. The one that I'm th- the episode I'm thinking of it got destroyed anyway, so you know, I'm fine with it. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it's it's just it's just going to be a soft miss for me. I it just it seems a little like taking an established design and just turning it around a bit just to appear different, and I'm not a big okay. fan of that. 
Well, the weird thing about it is that um, I think this was Andrew Probert. I could be wrong, so apologies if I'm uh, miscrediting it. But this was actually one of the initial ideas for the Romulan Warbird. Uh, I'm not sure if it was just a situation where somebody had designed it and they just weren't sure like which way up it went. So it did exist in terms of like it was a you know a previs or an idea that they had for to potentially do, and then it did start making appearances in sort of non-canon things like books and I think one of the ships of the line calendars. So I kind of knew about it by proxy as like an interesting idea. And I, I personally think it's a hit just because it's the geeky backstory of it. And it was so cool when it actually appeared in Lower Decks alongside the other more traditional uh, Warbirds. And I just thought, oh, cool, I get what you're doing there. <laughs> it's it's that thing. <laughs> so, you know, on a pure nerd level, I appreciate the little sort of Easter egg reference. I get what you guys are saying. I mean, it's no different. It literally is just a, you know, to Derodex turned on its side, I guess. Um, mm. But yeah, that's how we get some of the greatest things. That's how we got the Miranda class, because somebody just uh, didn't realize it was supposed to be the other way around. So, you know. <laughs> uh, the the, yeah. the anyway. Miranda class, I can kind of see. This This just smacks of kit bashing. Hmm. Well, I, but I, I know you. <laughs> I, I mean, I know you. I don't think there's a single, even the really, really goddamn awful ones. There's not a single Trek shit that you hate. Well, there are. There's at least one, but I own it anyway. So, <laughs> see, see, you got at you, Stockholm McGee syndrome. Class, that terrible design. <laughs> oh God, you're such a hostage. It was to cheap. This thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's for another day. Well, uh, yeah, two misses and a hit. So I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I, I kind of have to feel I've been outvoted on that one, and we'll see a bit of a miss, unfortunately. So sorry, lower decks. <laughs> I guess. Weirdly enough, keeping on the theme of lower decks, this isn't Romulan themed. Uh, but it is something that came up, and at least I know you've seen this episode, DK. Uh, so hit or miss for the character of where's it? Moopsie. Oh, and, I, uh, I knew you were going to go there, man. <laughs> DK, I'm coming to you first, just to mix it up a bit. Hit or a miss for Moopsie? This is 100% a hit. How can you just <laughs> not like Moopsie? Moopsie! It's just, yes. <laughs> It's just absolutely fantastic. I love it. I love the design. I love that the I love the vicious nature and the episode <laughs> it, it kicked off in was just hilarious. So yeah, love it. Yes, from the episode, I have no bones, but I must flee. <laughs> yes, because this little cute thing will eat your bones. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Jordan, what do you think about Moopsie? Bearing in mind that he will eat your bones. <laughs> <laughs> I think Moopsie is definitely a hit. Um... <laughs> I think it's adorable, and of course, Lower Decks, I think the episode handled the concept of Moopsie perfectly. It fit in with the series, because it's hilarious. Um, yeah, definitely a hit for me. And, I mean, so many people in the fandom, it seems like it struck a chord, because there's Moopsie yeah. jokes all over Mastodon, all over Instagram, <laughs> all over Blue yeah. Sky. So, yeah. um, it's been fun. It's been a fun uh, community builder as well. Oh, yeah. Moopsie was memed to death, definitely. Um, well, I'll start by saying massive hit for me. It's one of those things where I want to be cynical about it because it's clearly designed to to evoke the exact response it got. But you can't fault it because it was just so dang effective. Like the joke, the idea that it's cute but vicious, the, the sheer nature of how cute it looks and the way it's animated. And yeah, shout out to uh, my good friend uh, Andy. Uh, Andy Kemp, who we'll have on the podcast probably, uh, or at least on the Silver Screen podcast in a few weeks, um, who is not even a Star Trek fan or anything, but saw this uh, this little gif of Moopsie, became weirdly obsessed with it and decided he was going to watch uh, Lower Decks just to get to this thing that he was just captivated by. And yeah, that's the power of Moopsie, I guess. <laughs> Congrats to uh, whoever came up with this idea. Yeah, I mean, I can't say I'm surprised that Moopsie was an overwhelming uh, three out of three hit. <laughs> Incidentally, DK, how far did you get in that series? Was that one of the last Lower Decks episodes you've actually seen? I think the last one I saw was uh, The Wedding. Oh, the Wedding yeah, I was Yeah. Uh, I love that episode of Mariner getting stabbed constantly. <laughs> that might have been the last episode I watched as well. I never finished the most recent season. What? Neither oh, wow. of you finished it? What's going on here? <laughs> Mike, I've told you before, I don't like laughter. So oh. I'm not as invested in Lower Decks. Oh, but it's not just that. Uh, it gets really geeky and cool and you should watch it. Especially I'm going to watch time. it eventually. Uh, the next thing on the list is related to the overall theme. Uh, it's a group, actually. 
uh, from Star Trek Picard, but probably not the one you're thinking. So hit or miss for the Zat Vash. And I will start us off just to be a bit different here and say it's a huge miss from me because <gasps> what the heck? <laughs> just It's just so, like, it, it, it reckons the idea of, oh, Romulans are now somehow terrified of technology, even though that's never been the case. And there's evidence that they aren't, like they want to, you know, study data and whatever. They're terribly not very well developed. They're just such a dumb idea. We've already got the co-op a lot. Now we've got this other little group. And they're such typical, like, ooh, we're just sneaky and underhanded. And then they ended up nearly destroying the universe with whatever thing ripped off from Mass Effect came through some portal and never got heard of again. So it's a huge miss for me. And uh, I'm going to come to you next, Jordan, if you have gathered your uh, composure after that gasp. That I, I, ha- I have not, sir. <laughs> Um, but I can't, yeah, they are a hit for me. Um, I think that a kind of small extremist subsect of Romulan culture makes a lot of sense. Um, isn't that just the co-op (laughs) Malotta? Well, they're, they're extremists in a different way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it tells you off for that matter actually. right i think <laughs> it jives really well with their their paranoia um and they're all all of those i think they're all women that we see um i think so Although are all is, they're all just is narek is that rush because well not. i think he was just helping his sister yeah, I Maybe? can't remember. I don't quite remember. It's been a long well, time since I've yeah. rewatched season one of Picard. I haven't felt quite so masochistic for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but he, um, sorry, they, yeah, they're all just badasses. Um, and part of part of my love for them is, I think, visually and musically, the scenes mm. with them are just beautiful, um, which I think adds to my enjoyment of them. Um it is a little weird the like obsession with technology or the the fear mm. of technology but it also kind of makes sense um does it though <laughs> it it kind of does i think that because they're not just they're not afraid of technology they're afraid of artificial intelligence mm. and i mean i've been having so many conversations about ai with other creators right now Mm. um that it kind of i mean this is it kind of i could see that happening you know um okay i see where you're coming yeah yeah, from from a yeah from a real world perspective it would be an interesting thing now to explore it was perhaps a little bit ahead of its time um but yeah okay yeah so they're a hit for me i also love Picard season one so (laughs) i'm a little biased Fair enough. Well, you did say you hate laughter, and there's very short supply of that. I like being devastated, so I love season one. Although that plumbing accent and whatever costume in Stardust City Rag is pretty flipping amusing, but never mind. (laughs) DK, we've got one miss, one hit, so you're going to have to be the decider here, the Zatvash. It's going to have to be a miss from me. Ah, Take that, Jordan. No, it's, it's just... Just by default, because until you brought them up, I had completely <laughs> forgotten about them. It's kind of like Which Picard the, they're secret. came and went. They're a secret, DK. That's the point. Well, yeah, but then, then it, 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 you know, we're back into Romulans being shady again. And that's, no, <laughs> yeah, no. I just, no. <laughs> no, okay. it's, it's a miss. It's a miss for me. It's I, I, again. It's another one of those that I don't hate, but it's they, they, oh, my my memory doesn't even register them enough to consider them <laughs> part of canon. So I'm I'm just gonna have to be a. It's just gonna have to be a miss. I'm they were so important that to that first season of Picard because I'm sure it was one of their members that got forcibly assimilated that therefore crippled the cube. And then they were the ones that kind of put the weird mind meldy thing on, I forget, on Jurati and everything. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, they basically were the ones that screwed everything up. <laughs> yeah. of... I can remember none of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly we need you to rewatch season one of Picard. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then I'm going to have to sit through Riker making pizza and like a copy paste. Hey, that fleet. was the best part of season one, don't you, Dad? <laughs> mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> Anyway, I will stop sharing because we've said, wow, we're actually surprisingly negative this week. Maybe it's Jordan's influence. (laughs) Yeah, I have that effect on people. (laughs) 
next thing is not related to the theme of the series, but it is related to the series that we are looking at an episode of. And I think we may have done this uh, character already, or we may have covered this already, so apologies if so. But what the heck. Uh, so hit or miss for the character of Osira. And uh, why, Jordan, we'll come to you first. You're, again, you're, you, you know all things Discovery, so why not? I love her. She's a huge hit. Um, I will say the first time I watched season three, she was not a hit for me. Ooh, but okay. having rewatched it many times, she's a huge hit. Um, side note, she's the current cosplay that I'm working on. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Okay. I can't I, wait to see that. <laughs> I know. Me, uh, me too. I don't know how this is going to come together. How are you going to do the green body paint, though? That's got to be uncomfortable. Uh, well, I mean, it'll just be like my neck and my face. Okay. That's green. I'm going to have green gloves instead. That way I don't, you know, I can I can touch things without getting paint everywhere. But I currently have green body paint. It's on the way from Amazon to me right now. Um, awesome. So, yeah, when I'm, I'm going to Trek Long Island at the end of may and um janet kidder will be there and so i i am so excited you guys okay that so (laughs) again maybe i'm a little biased but i'm cosplaying her because i love her um i love how morally gray she is um she's kind of like she has like hints of robin hood but she's still really bad where like robin hood was like good (laughs) um which i i appreciate um i just love a strong woman too even if they're bad. Um, mm. I She's ruthless. She's, but also like, I mean, we're, you know, we we're talking about Ken Mitchell earlier, like her, her relationship with Aurelio really mm. is fascinating to me definitely, uh, because yeah. there's definitely a tenderness there and an empathy there. Um, Janet Kidder is, um, she's masterful as Osira. Um, I love that she kills her nephew um <laughs> oh that was brutal i remember that now that was, yeah. it was brutal but i loved how brutal that was um yeah i could go on and on but she's a hit for me yeah and ultimately she's the niece of lois lane so you know <laughs> points for that one. <laughs> yes. uh dk then we'll come to you a hit or a miss for osira i uh she's definitely a hit for me uh Ooh. disregarding the uh the uh mago kidder connection I just think she's a great character. I love the interplay between her and fans. I uh, mm. yes, I, yes. It, 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 <laughs> you know, I'm gonna maybe go a little off tangent here, but the, it, it, I really have a bee in my bonnet for those people that seem to, that say Discovery went off the rails around season three. Season three onwards have been my favourite seasons of Discovery, mm. okay. and uh, Asira is part of that. So yeah, to all those season three and four haters. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I well... second that. Absolutely, DK. <laughs> Yikes, fair enough. A lot of people I'm, I've noticed, this is completely off ta- uh, off topic-ish, but I've noticed a lot of people had a problem with the reveal of the burn, which I've never had an issue with. Um, mm. But yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say massive hit. As I said, Woo! disregarding the fact that she's you know related to margot kidder who i adore as a huge superman fan obviously um she's a fantastic actress and i think for me she's probably the best villain portrayal that we've had in trek for years because villains in the trek franchise are notoriously hit and miss no pun intended <laughs> and, <laughs> and i think she just really pulled it off there were times when you found yourself almost empathizing almost mm-hmm. agreeing with her mm-hmm. so it wasn't it wasn't, as you said, Jordan, it wasn't black and white. It wasn't like mustache twirly, haha, I'm evil. But then when she had to be vicious and brutal, it was all the more shocking. And I think, yeah, she was. She really proved more than a match for, for Discovery and her crew in a way that I think was really interesting. Um, and like you said, just uh, anyone that can force uh, a conversation with a Starfleet Admiral where they say this doesn't taste bad for shit. <laughs> definitely oh, that's one of my favorite gifts. It's so funny. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think just fantastically portrayed. I'm, it's a shame that we, you know, spoiler alert, we had to get rid of her at the end of season three because I really would have loved to see more of this character. And I really hope you know, that we get to see Janet again in some capacity in Star Trek or heck in something else even, because she really did impress me with her acting chops in in what could have been a really difficult role. So yeah, I think uh, an overall hit, I think, for uh, for Osira. Um, right. 
So the last thing on the list for today then is going back to the overall theme. Sorry, DK. <laughs> I got a feeling I know what's going to happen. You're going to tell me you don't remember this, but this is a couple of episodes that make up a two-parter. It is kind of Romulan themed. It's from Deep Space Nine. Hit or miss for the episodes Improbable Cause and The Die is Cast. And if you need a refresher of what that episode's about, uh, well, I'll give one anyway because the audience might be listening. So this is basically, it, I believe it's in season three of DS9 and it's kind of considered a turning point because it's basically the... Uh, Cardassian Obsidian Order and the Romulan Tal Shiar have gathered a combined fleet to attack what they think is the Founder's homeworld. Uh, Garak tortures Odo for information. They bombard it, and it turns out to have been a complete mislead. It's not the Founder's homeworld, and the fleet gets ambushed and completely decimated, and it's kind of the first official big strike in the Dominion War. So, yeah, hopefully that jogs a few memories if you're stuck. Uh, DK, I'm coming to you first. Hit or miss? Uh, it's a hit. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a good two parter in an exemplary Star Trek series for me. So you know, th there is not one episode of Deep Space Nine that I would consider a miss. Yes, even that one. Uh, so yeah, profit and uh, lace, DK. <laughs> look, look, I can. It's oh god, oh god, I had forgotten that one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, I take that back a little, but. The majority, the ma it's, yeah, it's not as okay. it's not as a group. Let's just say it's not as egregious as a certain episode from another series. For me. Oh, don't even bring that up again. We're, no, we're getting to the point where people are literally having drinking games about how much you can diss the Voyager episode, the fight. <laughs> that see, I'm all up for that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to try and work it into as many episodes as humanly possible. I'll tell you what, I'd watch Chakotay boxing a million times before I watch Quark's comedy cross dressing again. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. But anyway, yes. And and no, at least I could stay awake through the Quark episode. Uh, yeah, this one, a hit. Okay. Uh, Jordan, what about you? Are you familiar enough with the episode? And, uh, it's what been a while it? since I've watched it, um, but yeah. it's a hit for me. Okay. Um, yeah. It seemed... I'm glad that they, they did the story that they did. Um... And I, my, my, the details for me are a little muddy because it's been a while. Um, mm. But, you know, the Romulans and the Romulans and who joining forces? Cardassians. That's right. Well, there's one on the screen. I can't believe I didn't. Oh, yeah. Um, the Romulans and the Cardassians joining forces to try to um, destroy the founders. Um, that that made a lot of sense to me story-wise. Um, the Romulans that I do remember in the episode were were good. It weren't uh, really a focus, to be fair. I mean, I've included it because they are part of that joint fleet, but really it was more about Enar Brentain and the right. Obsidian Order. And, and I do, and I, yeah, Tara. and I do love Enar Brentain as a character yeah. as well. So, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, seeing Odo suffer was really difficult. That makeup job, the special effects they did, yeah, were yeah. horrifying. Yeah, a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal two-parter. Um, yeah, okay. there's not much else to say about it for me. Yeah, I'll join in the chorus of praise and say hit as well then. I remember being really surprised at the time because of the twist, which I hope I haven't spoiled it for nobody, anybody hasn't seen this, but the idea that they bombard what they think is the founder's home world and it's not. And it was all just a big, like they were, you know, one step ahead, which happened a lot in the first sort of uh, days of the Dominion War, shall we say, in season three and four. A lot of times you thought people had an advantage and then it turns out the founders were sort of three steps ahead, mocking you from the shadows, which I kind of loved. And uh, yeah, seeing this fleet of uh, all of the Romulan and Cardassian ships just get completely wasted was just a gasp moment for me at the time. And as you say, I love the character of Tain and Garak, their relationship. It was horrible to see Garak torturing Odo and the physical effects, but at the same time, it was compelling. Um, and I think, yeah, it's uh, like I said, you can't really... It wasn't necessarily the first salvo in the Dominion War. I think that probably was the search parts one and two, but it certainly was when we realized that, you know, stuff was getting real i think at this point so yeah hit for me as well so right that's uh all of the hit or miss section out of the way then it was a bit of a mixed bag more this week than uh, than we're used to so yeah uh i think uh, we still kept it relatively positive at the end there though so yeah uh, yeah that uh that will conclude that and so uh, we're gonna jump now into the episode proper that we're reviewing. As I've mentioned already, the episode this week is going to be the Star Trek Discovery episode Unification 3. Uh, and if you 
just indulge me for one second. I have some slight behind the scenes stuff that I wanted to get out. Hopefully it's not too boring. Uh, but we will begin our analysis. And uh, yeah, I will jump in with some behind the scenes, as I said, just a little bit of background information. If you want to chime in with any uh, thoughts or feelings on it, feel free uh, and I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. Uh, so yeah, this episode is the first one to be numbered as the third in a multi-episode story and the first one to continue the episode numbering and its title from a completely different Star Trek series as it continues, continues the Vulcan Romulan reunification storyline from the next gen's unification one and two, which we looked at last week. Uh, this episode seemingly... Excuse me, draws a conclusion to the actions began by Spock in the next gen namesake episodes, which were further explored in Face of the Enemy and Star Trek 2009. Indeed, events of this episode replace Spock's speech about closed minds that have kept these two worlds apart from century, for centuries from Unification 2, which I know DK appreciates, judging by his avatar, uh, and present them as part of a record from circa Stardate 45825. Uh, the Kawat Malot, who appear in this episode, were introduced in the Star Trek Picard episode Absolute Candor. We kind of touched on that. Uh, Nivar, the new name for Vulcan, was previously used for the name of a Vulcan starship in the Enterprise episode Shadows of Pajem. Nivar was a term coined around 1967 by linguist Dorothy Jones, who wrote the Dorothy and Mefanwi series of Star Trek stories for the fanzine T-Negative in the late 60s and early 70s. It literally means two-form and was an art form practiced on Vulcan in which a subject was examined from two different viewpoints or in terms of having two different aspects or natures. So quite appropriate. Um, the USS Yelchin, the ship whose black box is studied by Burnham, is seemingly named as tribute to the late Anton Yelchin, who played Pavel Chekhov, of course, in the three Kelvin timeline movies. Uh, its rare registry of NCC-4774E implies that it is at least the sixth starship to bear this name. Okay. Um, Gabrielle Burnham first appeared in season two of Discovery, which also details how she ended up trapped in the far future, like the USS Discovery herself. Her arrival in the new timeline, where Discovery has prevented control from destroying the universe, would seem to imply that their victory was a predestination paradox or a fixed event that was always going to happen once set in motion. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Jeremy on this. This just gives me a headache. I'm not talking anymore about that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this episode marks the first appearance of recurring guest star Tara Rosling as Nivar president Tarina. It also reveals that Vulcan, as Nivar, despite being a founding member, has left the United Federation of Planets as a result of the devastating effects of the catastrophe known as the Burn. The mystery of the Burn is the central story arc of season three of Discovery and as such is a pivotal part of this episode. <sighs> and that's all I have for the BTS. You'll be relieved to hear. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, before we uh, go any further, then I'm going to jump in with the big question that I always start off with, with which is, what were your overall spoiler-free, if possible, impressions of this episode? And can you remember how you felt the first time you watched it, and what were your overall feelings uh, coming out of it? And again, Jordan, you're the, the guest this week, so we'll come to you first. Um, this is one of my favorite Star Trek Discovery episodes, and one of my favorite Star Trek episodes. Of all time um wow. yeah um <laughs> i love a good it, this isn't quite a i mean you know i love a good courtroom drama um <clears throat> and I, I yeah i i love the character play between michael and gabrielle um mm. yeah i it seeing spock again mm. even i mean seeing leonard nimoy spock in a recording again was just uh, beautiful and I cry every time uh, I've watched it, which is I've watched it a lot and I cry every time. Um, yeah, I think it's it, it's a huge turning point in season three for Michael and her character. Um, it's beautifully done. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to mention this, but um, the director, John Didowski, Didkowski, this is actually his directorial debut. Wow. Okay. I, didn't I know. know I, yeah. I learned that um, in an interaction with um, one of the pr people in production that's on Mastodon uh, oh, cool. when I was talking about this episode. They let me know that, which I thought was very oh, impressive. <laughs> that is that is impressive. Yeah. yeah. I do know that it was written by uh, Kirsten Bayer, who uh, came up a lot during our conversation yeah. with David yes. Mack. Yep. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can kind of see I a lot of uh, signature touches, shall we say. From yes. <laughs> Sorry, did you think? I was going to say when I when, when her name flashed up on screen, I did do the Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, <laughs> sit up and point <laughs> point gif. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, well, I've got a feeling uh, I'm, I'm going to be unpopular and maybe have some disagreements. Hopefully, friendly with you guys because 
I'm not overly fond of uh, of Burnham and the portrayal and the character development in this episode, uh, which I'm sure I'll get into later. Um, but there's there's a lot of it about it that I do like still. Um, but again, I, I won't get into that because that's for later. When I, when I explain myself, hopefully we'll come to some kind of a, of a comprehension as to why I'm a little annoyed by it. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, before we, we uh, go into our sections, by the way, if you are new here or if you are unfamiliar, we break our notes down into sections, just roughly like writing and plot, direction, uh, acting, VFX, sound and music, uh, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but we don't stick rigidly to that. If the conversation goes a different way, we will follow it and we will uh, flow with it as, as uh, need be. So uh, we will do that. But before we do that, DK, you know what I'm going to ask. For the last uh, several weeks, we've had Adrienne here, and we've been homaging. Let's be kind. The uh, Delta Flyers podcast with uh, limericks and haikus, and without Adrienne to provide us a limerick, DK. Have you actually provided one for us this week, or, or shall we? Uh... Yeah, like like that's going to happen. My my <laughs> remit was uh, my remit was slash fic, but we already had Burnham and Booker in this, so <laughs> it's, it's not really needed. Well, and Saru and Tarina, Let's be fair. <laughs> oh yeah, there's some, there's some hot action going on there. Well, oh, yeah. To be fair, unification is five syllables, so I feel like it's like handing us. Oh, I've got a haiku. Don't worry okay, about that. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> that, good. Was, that was my remit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, weirdly enough, it does not use the word unification. <laughs> it was right there, Mike. <laughs> I know. I think one of my early drafts did, and I was just like, that's kind of cheating. I don't want a one word, five it syllable. Is. It <laughs> it's is. just kind of weird. Yeah, I do have a haiku, so bear with me. As I, I always explain this, but just in case you didn't know, uh, haiku is a Japanese poetry form which is basically uh, five syllables for the first line, seven for the second, and five for the third. Uh, so I've tried to do one that sums up the events of this episode. It's not particularly funny or anything, but hopefully it at least fits the rules. Uh, and my haiku is as follows. Burnham meets her mom and the legacy of Spock. Vulcan is Nivar. Oh, <laughs> Simple as that. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Yes, thank you, thank you. Straight to the point, but uh, yeah, as I say, if, if if Adrienne was here, I know she would have come up with some kind of funny limerick of some kind, but, you know, something about so near and yet so nevar or something. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. So, uh, yeah, with, uh, with that out of the way, then we're going to jump straight into the writing of this episode. Uh, so, where do we want to start? We've kind of talked about, so we may as well get into it, the kind of the, the, the Burnham of it all. <laughs> um so, uh, I, if uh, I'll kind of, you know, uh, give my uh, my point of view and see how you guys feel about it, if you agree or, uh, you know, if, if there's a dissenting point of view, I'm happy to sort of change my mind if, if uh, evidence presents itself. But for me, I just feel like this episode has a lot of what people are very critical about with Discovery, in that Burnham is just made out to be so uber special, like, and lampshading it by book calling out that she has, you know, a, an endearing messianic complex doesn't make it not so. It just makes it all the more annoying <laughs> to me. Um, and I can kind of live with that. She's the main character and she wants to solve the burn, etc. I'm kind of with it. But what bugs me is, and this happens around this point in season three or everywhere, a few episodes of the middle, is that she constantly keeps breaking the rules, questioning whether she belongs and stuff, and yet just gets away with it and fails upwards and ends up in the captain's chair as a result of just not doing anything right, which really bugs me, particularly when there was somebody in the captain's chair that was doing a fantastic job. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, dude, kind of... <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen politicians in this era, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not unheard of. I mean, I get it. And as I say, I appreciate that at least it gives us a chance to sort of explore you know, whether or not she belongs in that, to that end, that kind of being her journey towards the captaincy because she has to examine it from all angles and come at it from there, you know, whether or not she truly does want to, whether she's loyal to the Federation, etc. I kind of appreciate that on one level, but on the other level, it just feels like, like I said, she's just getting away with everything. She she breaks the rules and it's, it's treated like, oh, it's so terrible because I've been demoted from first officer position. She didn't even lose rank. It was just, it was barely a slap on the wrist after, because this is related obviously to what happened the previous episode, the previous week. And the end of the episode bugs me all the more because it's like, it had a chance to do something really interesting by her kind of throwing up, quitting and saying, 
Oh, I don't want to tear you guys apart, so I'm just going to not even ask you. But, you know, I'm putting my trust in you. And then she gets her own way anyway because Torino was like, oh, okay, then you can have the data. I'm just like, everything always works out for this woman. No matter what happens, it's so frustrating. Um, so, yeah, that was my point of view from this anyway. So uh, I'll give you guys a right to reply. I think, and uh, What do you think? Have I, have I got a point or am I just being really harsh? I'll let you on take this one. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. I think that seeing Burnham get demoted is something that we rarely saw for in other Star Treks for officers who disobeyed orders. She didn't really get demoted. She lost one position out of the two she was in, and she stayed a commander. So it's kind of like, come on. <laughs> but she, she's no longer first officer, um, which... It is a demotion. Um, so, yeah, I think... I, I see where you're coming from, but I, I, there are plenty of other instances in Star Trek where the same situation happened and there weren't repercussions that we saw um, mm. for, for the officer. Um, I think that it wasn't... It's a, it, it was a little off-putting that she got the data regardless, but having her mom say multiple times, like, there's some, there, this, you know, the, the three... Somebody else is watching. Yeah, yeah, somebody else is watching. There's other people, there's another audience here. I think really jived with things that Tarina was saying to, to Michael earlier when they mm. first met. And so it felt very consistent throughout the episode that that was a possibility. Um, and Michael gets very, his, historically in the show, gets very um, like tunnel vision. Mm. And so mm. to have her, you know, not even consider <laughs> the president of Navarre is also watching this and she has influence on what happens with this data um, is very Michael. And so... I, I don't know, that's, I felt like it, it, it jived that, well with sorry. her character. That's another thing that bugs me, though, is that the president just went over the heads of all of these sort of three people that were in the quorum that represented these different districts, and is that not going to create discord? Because you've effectively got a president who just ignores the rule of law. So what was the point of it in the first place? Well, we don't know. we don't know what the peers would have decided, because Michael, after she was honest with them, rescinded her request so mm. we don't know that the president went above what they would have decided there seemed to be you know the romulan yeah. Vulcan shira seemed to be in agreement the romulan um naraj wanted wanted to give her the data regardless that uh, was kinda, the point kinda, that was yeah that was the kinda, schism that the sort of the pure right, Vulcan and, guy i can't imagine being happy about like her, his president just going well i'm screw you i'm gonna do it anyway you <laughs> know well, and we don't know. We don't know that that's what she did. You know, we don't know the the inner workings of her making that decision. Um, mm. With the two of the three of them supporting giving her the data, that might have been the the reason she was able to right. do it. So I see. that's that kind of brings up another sort of issue that I have in that um, there's so many really good things that you could have explored here that I think are either ignored or just paid lip service to. These are really big ideas, and I really want to know more about like how the Romulans and Vulcans were able to finally put aside differences and mesh it as one culture, other than just being told it was because the co-op co lot helped. Well, how? I want to see more about this. I want to see the inner workings of of how that planet now works. And yeah, we got a little hint about there could still be some rather fractious, uh, you know, living together happening with the, the three quorum members. But again, it's not really addressed all that deeply and it's certainly not brought up again after this episode which is a shame yeah but um, you, you know i mean we've had this conversation before discovery is not really the series to explore those kind of things you never get that kind of breathing room no but as a critical reviewer i've kind of got to point out where the episode yeah. falls short for me in a, in the regard of you know it, it opens up a lot of really big ideas and then doesn't explore any of them in favor of yet again doing the whole Burnham doesn't feel she belongs story that we've had for three years now, you know, and dwelling on that again in favor when there's so many more interesting things in the background is another reason I think why it bugs me so much. Cause I'm like, we've been here. I mean, the point when 
Gabrielle brings up, oh, you mutinied against Philippa Giorgio. I'm like, oh, for God's sake, can we not just, are we bringing this up again? This was literally ancient history. It was 900 years ago, and we still feel the need to bring it up. Like, it, was it, nine, it was 900 years ago for everyone except for the crew of Discovery and Gabrielle Burnham. And it wasn't mm -hmm. that long ago that it happened for Michael. It was just a couple of years. I suppose. And but... I, I do think that the, the name of the episode obviously refers to the Romulans and the Vulcans, but I think it also refers to Michael and the Federation. Um, mm. And this That's is... a really good way of putting it, yeah. It's a, it's a really big turning point, not just for the season, but the entire series, because this is going to... This is the point where she says, you know, no, I am... I've, I've been away from the Federation. I'm back now. Am I going to stay here? Mm. And I think the, the recap of, you know, her mutiny and other, you know, other issues that she had with the Federation was a bit on the nose, but mm. I think it did highlight this is the, this is the kind of the crux of her journey towards the captain's chair. And so from this episode on, it's just making that happen. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm just anti-Burnham. For me, I, I find it, and I really love when she gets the captain's chair, that it actually starts exploring that journey in more interesting ways. So one of my favorite episodes is the season four premiere, Kobayashi, because it's her learning that as a captain, you can't win them all. You're not going to just get your own way at all times and just fall into victory. Sometimes you've got to accept, you know, a, a loss of some kind. And that was the thing that was missing in series three for me, because it was always just like... No matter what happened, it was it was fine and it worked out in the end and it was all great. And it's just kind of, I don't know. And, and like I said, I, I get so frustrated, at, even though the, the show calls it out at this idea that like she's, oh, well, I'm, I'm unsure of where I am now because the stakes are so high because I've got to solve the burn. And it's like, why are you? Why are you putting this? You're not responsible. Why are you having the full responsibility of having to solve this? It's... You know, it, it, you don't see any of the rest of the crew having this pressure on themselves. So, again, it's, it seemed like the show didn't have a good scripting reason why she felt responsible for it, uh, which kind of, again, sort of bugged me. <laughs> but again, <laughs> not wanting to, to pile on. It's just one of those things, like I said, as the main character, that's, you know, going to be the case. That's going to be what you do. But yeah, but still, I, I do still think we get, really yeah, enough. not to, not to be, uh, not to be arguing with you this entire podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> I do think we get a sense um, in, it's either in this episode or in the previous episode where she tells Vance the, the Federation can't exist unless we solve the burn because mm. of x y or z and so i think it is more than just she feels like she has to solve it it's she sees this i know earlier i said she struggles to see the big, bigger picture but in this case i feel like she did see the bigger picture of the federation can't actually continue to exist and come together and grow and help people unless we know what caused this yeah so i think that's I, part of it i get it but like again that kind of jibes with the whole issue of like the federation can't exist unless i solve this but i'm also not sure if i want to have anything to do with the federation it's kind of like we're never exploring that dichotomy we're just following whichever whim the writer seems to to want to be following this week or this scene and it's just it's so weird until we get to like you said the point which was really good which is the courtroom scene moment where it's basically burnham talking herself around which I think we needed where she's like, mm -hmm. I'm actually not doubting myself at all. I'm scared because the stakes are so high that I don't want to fail. And I'm as loyal as I always was to the Federation and to Starfleet. It's just that I'm putting this pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, yeah, that's that's it. That's the crux of it that we should have gotten to way sooner without all of this. I don't think I can represent the Federation. I don't know if I belong here. What's going on? And this angst ridden, like, oh, <laughs> just it's just so tiring at times. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, well, what we'll do, uh, we'll we'll take a little break now. Then, uh, if you are listening on Federations of Space Radio, uh, if you are on YouTube, stay tuned for a little advert that we'll edit in. Uh, but we'll all have a break and cool down, and I will try and uh, not be attacked, <laughs> I guess, by uh, by the two deciding voices here. And we'll come back and hopefully still all be friends. So uh, join us <laughs> on the other side of that. Action. We're the Silver Screen Podcast. Hey there, film buffs. I'm DK, your cult movie uber geek, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Wilson. 
That's right, folks. We're your guides through the world of cinema, from beloved classics to the hottest films in the zeitgeist. On the Silver Screen Podcast, we dive deep into film culture. Join us as we review movies with honesty and respect, offering our unique take on what makes them tick. And don't forget our Silver Screen Cult Classics episodes. We'll take you on a journey through the hidden gems, the cult films that deserve more love, and the stories behind them. We've a blast welcoming all manner of movie-loving guests for lively discussion and to share our love of films. Their passion and knowledge make every episode a cinematic adventure. Plus, we'll give you our own scores straight from the heart out of five stars. You'll hear our honest verdict, no matter how much we geek out about a film. And remember what Arnie said, we'll be back. So don't miss a single episode of the Silver Screen Podcast. Subscribe now to the Silver Screen Podcast YouTube channel or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Let's embark on a cinematic journey like no other. Whether you're a casual moviegoer or a true cinephile, the Silver Screen Podcast is your ticket to film magic. And, and cut. cut. Oh, I like this. I'm just sitting back and watch you two go at it. It's awesome. I'm not. I, I certainly have no <laughs> ill will, and I wanted. I want to like it. That's what's frustrating. I kind of want to be told what what angle I'm not seeing, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Because in case there's something that I'm missing. And I'm not like, whatever you say is wrong. So it's blah, blah, blah. It's just like, what am I not understanding that you were trying to do in the episode? Anyway, uh, so regardless. Uh, so we're back. Yeah, so we're still talking about uh, Discovery's episode Unification 3. Uh, I think we're still basically talking about the writing and the the characterizations. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, myself and Jordan have reached something of an impasse in, in regards to the character of Burnham. So we'll probably leave that there. Um, and we will say... I've kind of touched on it, but how do you guys feel that the episode did handle this big concept of uh, of Romulo Vulcan reunification? DK, you've been quiet for a while. How do you? Uh, I've said already. I think we could have done more, and I would have liked to see more. But the idea itself, I think, is beautiful. Um, so, what do you think of the idea? And how it's a, it's it's a great concept. Uh, I you know again, I don't think I, I I was long past expecting any kind of in depth exploration of any of the big ideas within discovery uh i think it's something that we're not only we're, i'll start again we're only going to see with uh, with regards to expanded media because right. mm-hmm. unfortunately you know the rest of the series is set long before Navarre, you know even is attempted so unless they do anything with it with starfleet academy and i can't see that happening it's it's just going to be one of those things that's left out there. So, I mean, it is addressed. I don't know if you guys even remember this, but it is addressed quite well early in season four when Nivar's trying to rejoin the Federation. Mm-hmm. And again, I really like that episode. I like the way it's everything's handled there. The, you know, we've as I say, we've mentioned it so many times. It's the downside to Discovery. Everything mm-hmm. is a apocalyptic scenario. It doesn't give the concepts, the characters, for the most part, time to breathe and. And it's a shame because I really like this era. I really like the characters. I want to see more of them. I think it's just, you know, it's down to what we've been lumbered with. It, yeah. It is what it is. And, and, and you know, by this point, I'd started accepting pretty much everything as, as face, va- face value. Hmm. I mean, I will say it, it's not a fault of the writers or the show itself that it is by its nature less episodes in a season than we or wherever we ever got in the past. So there's less chance to do deeper explorations. And I certainly don't fault the show for that. And likewise, it's kind of sad that now we know the fifth season is going to be the last. So we're still not going to really have much time to explore these things. Because I was going to say, well, hopefully the fifth season won't have this overriding thing that has to you know, permeate every episode in the way that the Burn or Species 10C did. But even if that's not the case, it's one 10 episode season out of the five and then we're we're closing our doors and, and done which is a shame you know um because there is there's some cool ideas there's some great characters there's so many things that i want to see more of in this world i'm certainly not a discovery hater i don't want to give that impression um but it's just frustrating when you can only scratch the surface i i'm i mean you've got to understand i'm approaching it from someone that's not really watched discovery since they were first aired right. so all these and and your memory is just beyond compared to mine. I mean, you know. Well, to be fair, I am re watching series four at the minute and just did well, rewatch it, series three, so it's like Exactly. It's I mean, fairly fresh. Even you know, as you as you found out early, even my favourite series I have trouble recalling sometimes, such as the <laughs> nature of my probably excessive use of alcohol. But uh yeah, it's it's 
I'm coming into it as someone that, that does kind of vaguely remember all these times that, you know, we've gone through this with Burnham. But mm. because it's not really recent for me, mm. it was refreshing to watch this episode. Maybe if I did a rewatch, you know, and watch, you know, went straight from Battle of the Binary Stars onwards, maybe I would, by this point, I'd be going, oh, God, please, I can see where Mike's coming from. But watching it as a standalone episode in the midst of all this... I found this quite. I find it quite well written, if I'm being honest. I thought right. they they managed to fit quite a lot in, and again, maybe it's just me accepting things at face value, but I I I was I was tuning in expecting to be completely lost, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to me, it's a strength that when I did watch it, I wasn't, you know, and I I okay. picked it up fairly quickly, and I came away thinking, yeah, that was a good fifty minutes. And okay. I don't, I don't always get that. And to me, that's how these things hold up. So to that end, because I was going to bring it up. So do you think it really didn't, it didn't hurt your viewing of this episode that you were watching an isolated part of like a chapter of the Burn story? It, it, it didn't bother you that, that when they were dealing with that, I guess. No, no, no. So I mean, obviously, I'd you know, I'd, I'd watched the see the season when it was aired. I remember. Yeah, so you know the outcome off. already, but yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I kind of knew where I was. It was just like going back to a, you know, a book that you've read and enjoyed, picking up, looking at a middle, you know, one of the middle chapters, and reading. I mean, why you would do that, I'm not entirely sure, unless it was a particularly <laughs> well written book. But yeah, it's. Uh, I I just went in. I I'll, I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting something great, uh, just because it is. There is a there is a general arc. They're, they're not really standalone episodes when it comes to Discovery. But I came in, I was entertained, I wasn't, you know... It, it's not like someone coming in and watching episode 8 of Twin Peaks for the first time, season 3, and right. thinking, you know, OK, I, I really didn't realise I was doing drugs, but I need to cut down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's... It, it, I came in, I watched it, it held up, and I left entertained, and... Yeah. Okay. There, there, there was no so, downside to this one, and as uh, as you know, Jordan mentioned earlier, there was a nifty little bit of a courtroom drama in there, and I really hmm. dig that that kind of thing. I see. I, I'm fresh off rewatching Ad Astra per Aspera, which is just flawless, beautifully written courtroom stuff, and nothing's going to compare to that, frankly. So, uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, I, we I don't can, we don't agree on that. that at all, actually. Mike. Oh. Oh, oh. Well, that's a different conversation. We'll have to have you on that review then. Oh, yeah. If you want to argue with me, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what right, do you guys. have against that episode? I'm give, me time to, give me time to buy a bell from Amazon so I can get you back <laughs> to respective corners every few minutes. Ding, ding. Yeah, anyway, Jordan, uh, so you, you kind of, we didn't really ask you, I was talking to DK about it, but how did you feel of, with regard to how the episode handles the, the idea of uh, the reunification? And did you find it distracting or problematic, the, the whole Burn storyline, or were you not bothered by it? Um, so for as far as the reunification of uh, the Romulans and Vulcans, I want more, but I didn't think this episode was a place for more um, because the reunification happened hundred a couple hundred years ago um right yeah and so it made sense that we didn't get more but i i desperately as a romulan fan i desperately want more backstory um Mm. but i yeah it didn't seem it didn't seem like the place for it yeah Um, i'll see that point it probably wasn't fair of me to expect anything from this episode itself um but yeah i mean other episodes maybe if we had more time but yeah, maybe it is unfair of me to have expected a lot, which, I mean, this episode did give a lot, at least explained we are reunified. This is how we were able to do it with a little bit of help. And we even see the, you know, the different viewpoints from the three people in the quorum, which is a nice, mm-hmm. uh, quick writing, easy way of showing we've now got Vulcans, Romulans, Romulo Vulcans, and they're all of their own minds. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> cool, we have sorry. The, we, have the, we still have logic purists in, the Vul- in mm-hmm. some of the Vulcans. Um, we still have paranoia and pride in some of the Romulans and then, but that's not, you know, that's not true of everyone. And, um, they are making it work, even if it is still a bit, um, volatile at times. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I want more, but you're going to have to, you know, place those stories a couple hundred years prior to this episode for us to get more. 
would you like us to be very happy to see a spin-off novel series or series of some kind exploring the actual birth of like how the reunification happened? I presume. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Give me like a, an encyclopedia of like this is the these are the historical events that happened from <laughs> Spock through the reunification. <laughs> we I, I say we make a series and we make it like the Star Trek equivalent of Game of Thrones. We do like six years of how we got to unified. <laughs> Robbie and the Buggins after them fighting each uh, other and then the co-op a lot step again. And maybe one of these years I'll explore it in my fanfic. Um, but I was I just going to say you have to write it. You're the writer. So. I'm still trying to figure out where the Klingons are in the 32nd century. So still, <laughs> well, we might find out that. in season five. You never know. I hope so because in my fanfic I'm very lost. I'm just like, I don't know. Uh, I can't answer this question. I need them to do it for me. Um, we know that then, uh, they they at least get name checked in this episode because of the whole you meet need to fight the Klingons in the war, so people know yes. who they are still. <laughs> yes, and they're they're referenced multiple times in season four, and so mm. um, they know who they are. We just don't know where they are, um, or what they so, look like for that matter. <laughs> I know. So what? Uh, what was your other question? Um, yeah, the whole idea of the burn. Did you find it distracting, or was it more of a standalone thing for you this episode? This episode was it- yeah. Um, I think as far as Discovery episodes go, this is a pretty good standalone episode, but I think part of that is they do give you recap in, in different things. Um, it's not, it's not a bottle episode, but it's close, um, Mm. which I think is helpful. It kind of, you know, yeah, it is a, a turning point for the, the season two, which I think is, is helpful. Um, so, yeah, that's, those are my thoughts about the burn in this, in this episode, at least. Yeah. It's a weird one because I feel like it feels like you should be lost. And yet I feel like the way that they make the burn both vitally important because of this whole, we need the SB19 data and it could be any MacGuffin at the same time. You don't necessarily need the, the backstory. So I actually really thought that was quite cleverly handled because, Again, you could have said this was anything. This was we need any amount of data on anything from the from Navar, but tying it into your season arc like that, I think, kept it in the audience's mind and in the foreground in quite a good way. So mm. I I, I kind of like that. Um, but on the kind of flip side of that, um, I have to ask, how do you guys feel this worked as the third part of unification? Because that's where I think it kind of falls apart a little for me. Um, DK, what do you think? Do you think it works as as an immediate follow up to those two episodes we just watched? Not really. It's 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 kind of lip service. I mean, obviously you've got the Navarre aspect, and yeah, that's there. But I think they were just kind of maybe grasping at straws a little to tie it back to uh, the the original two part. I mean, yeah, we had the the uh, the inexplicable spot recording at the start, and I think it was just a way of kind of getting maybe trying to get people on side or maybe trying to tie it back to something that it wasn't really a part of yeah. i mean obviously it, it you know it's got lots of references to spark and it's got lots of references mm-hmm. to what happened and things like that but i think i'm not going to say they were unnecessary but i think they were just kind of uh, member berry almost yeah okay See, I like a lot of how Spock is handled, but that's another of my bugbears is ending the episode with, oh, the president wondered how much of who Spock was was because of his sister. And I'm like, oh, get out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> that bugged me. But other than that, I liked the way it was kind of fed through. And I think the presence of the the sort of clip from Unification too, and all of those references, I think, for me, really works to link it in a way to that it's just it's as you say it feels maybe a little forced at times um yeah. in the way that i mean I, I get it but i wouldn't necessarily have called it unification three you know um which rather promises something different but anyway so, uh, with that kind of d- dealt with that there's a couple of other things i wanted to sort of talk about with the regards to the writing without hopefully getting too contentious uh, so how do you guys feel about the presence of gabrielle burnham in the episode which could have been I guess, slightly controversial, and I think some people may have had an issue with it, judging by some of the conversations I've had with people and the the audience response. Uh, Jordan, did you think uh, she fit quite well into this episode? And to that, related to that, did you feel the co-op Malot did as well? Because, you know, they're the same thing, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I thought she fit well. I I was wondering when I was watching season three where she was and if and Mm. when they would find her 
Um, I, I like to imagine that Michael spent most of that first year by herself looking for her mom. Uh, she clearly never uh, never once looked up her previous homeworld because she's surprised to learn after a year that Vulcan is now Navarre. So. Mm-hmm. Right, but I, yeah, just wondering. I imagine her looking for her mom, um, and it was yeah. really... She did say she checked on Tyrolisium, I think, didn't she, when she first went there? Yeah, yep. Um... I think she would have looked on SR4. That's the natural next step, isn't it, really? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so it was... I was pleased to, to see her. I thought the... Um, the reveal of her was very, very similar to her initial reveal in season two, mm, um, yeah. where, you know, the, the red angel, they capture the red angel. You're wondering who this is in the season two, thinking it's Michael. Um, yeah. And then, you know, the helmet comes off and Michael's like, mom, you know, kind of almost the exact same um, shots, shots with, in, yeah. this, with, in this episode, Brilliantly which, directed I, that reveal, which I, yeah. yeah, which I loved that. Um, it seemed very, her character seemed very consistent with mm-hmm. how she was in Perpetual Infinity, but with a lot of the edge taken off because she's no longer trying to destroy control. Oh, right. um, I think there was edge there. And uh, I think, yeah, making her a co op a lot seems like it was an excuse to have her get away with being incredibly bitchy and really harsh, I think, to uh, to Michael. I think it's at, at points in that uh, quorum. I think the I think the she was still um I think her motives were different and I think she was mm. still as Michael said you know being a parent um yes, of course. Yeah. in a way that in perpetual infinity she had kind of removed herself as Michael's parent because she just couldn't do it anymore um she didn't know she was going to be around as you say so yeah I mean, and that's... so I I think yeah. it's a really interesting juxtaposition with those two episodes in particular mm. Um, so I, I loved seeing her again. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. cool. I'll, I'll give my thoughts in a sec. DK, what about you? Uh, I'll be honest. When she uh, when she first appeared, I was like, oh, God, here we go. And I thought it was going to be a very kind of soap opera aspect of it. And, yeah, you did get that. But uh, Gabrielle really impressed me in this one. I I like the 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 co-op Mallard angle. Uh, I I think she was really good in the role, and I don't know whether it's just because I've been exasperated so much by my own parents, but I really kind of empathise with Michael in the middle of that <laughs> quorum. Uh, yes, it's yeah. I I thought Gabriel was really good in this, and I've not been a biggest fan in previous episodes, so that surprised me more than anything in this one. Okay. Um, see, I, I understand why people would potentially have a problem with Gabrielle's presence and the sort of everything linking back to Michael kind of thing. But for me, it doesn't bother me because I like the character and because it does something I just complained about in that it actually gives you a bit more depth and more character to explore, um, yeah. as opposed to just always looking at this from the angle of does Michael belong and it's all an internal struggle. I think it was actually inspired. I really was curious, like Jordan, where... Gabrielle was going to come in. I liked her in season two, unlike you clearly did it. And I like her here. I think Sonia Sohn is a great actress. And uh, she kind of, it's it's amazing to see that growth, even though it was kind of off screen between, like you say, the kind of, I've got to save everything, war-torn woman almost of season two and this full of candor space monk of season three. But what I like is that we actually do get to see her be a parent. As you say, even though she's really harsh about it, I love that we get the scene of Burnham calling her out with, oh, you picked a great time to do some parenting. And then her snippy response of, is this what you were like as a 12-year-old? Which is like, yes, exactly. <laughs> Stop being a brat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, But I, I just find it really emotional at the very end as well, knowing what they've been through when she says, you know, I can't go with you, but I've got something to say that I've wanted to say for a long time. You always know where you can find me. It's like, oh, <laughs> you know? maybe it's just because I'm close to my mum, so I always kind of feel that emotion. That's why I don't have an issue with the burn, by the way, because I'm like, oh, if my mum died, I'd tear apart half the universe. I think that's all I've got on the writing for now. Excuse me. Um, Can I ask a question? Think, of course, yeah. What did you think about Tilly being the temporary oh. a- acting first officer? I'm very torn on that. I forgot that was one thing I was going to bring up because... I love the character of Tilly and I love what they're implying. And some of my favorite scenes in the episode are her realizing how kind of loved she is and how she, she would be accepted. But at the same time, it's 
absolute nonsense with everything we've learned about how Starfleet works as a kind of military organization. And so the the sort of nitpicky geek in me is like, oh, I can't accept this. But I really want to on a character level. And I'm just like, it would have been so... I just think we're missing her getting an earlier promotion. If if we'd had Saru say, you can be the first officer, we'll promote you to lieutenant, which she gets to be at the end of season three anyway, it would, for me, have alleviated some of that. Kind of like, you know, we're all following an ensign foolishness. Yeah, um, but you, you see that... that... That that whole thing with her her rank and the position makes me look at Michael's position, what you were on about earlier, with a little bit more. I guess I could say rose tinted spectacles, because then I could just think, yeah, they're all. Like it. It's just it. It's just a ship where it's it's more like a family than a, a you know a Star Trek Ugh. crew, and anything goes. Screw it, you no. know. No, no, I, I can't. I can't have that. I'm too geeky. <laughs> and my, my my autism's like no, there is rank and there is structure. Damn it! I don't don't make me break out, Joel. Ah, <laughs> uh, Joel Hodgson. It's just a show. Just relax. But no, I mean, I I get it, and I know it's a silly thing to be hung up on. But at the same, and like I said, on a, on a character level, I don't know that I would have written it differently. I probably just would have written in some geeky explanation as to why she got a quick promotion or something. But. And to be fair to them, they do address it. I mean, Stamets does say, technically, you'd outrank me. And she says, well, position, but not rank. Excuse me. So, and, you know, oh, taking orders from you would be deeply weird kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, I just I, I just love that scene where the crew have all clearly been down in the dock and bay watching Spartacus at the very end. So, yeah. yeah, say yes. <laughs> and how cool, that line just makes me laugh when Burnham's like... Uh, Busts in and, and you know starts the conversation. Oh, and what the data, and then just goes. Oh, did I miss the cool say yes? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the, the, the images it conjures of the crew just sitting together organizing these things. You know, like, we're gonna do this. It's gonna be so cool. <laughs> it just it does make it. It warms my heart because the only one that we see her tell is Stamets, and he's typically this like. I mean, he's becoming less grumpy <laughs> as the season goes, as the series goes on. But mm -hmm. um, and I love the evolution of Stamets and Tilly's friendship. And so to imagine him being like, all right, I'm going to get everybody in on this to encourage Tilly to accept it. It's just really heartwarming yeah. to me. Yeah. Oh, completely. And I agree. I think that's one yeah. of my favorite, uh, favorite things. But yeah. I also love the way that, like I said, it, it allows you to have the interaction between Saru and Tilly. Who yes. haven't typically interacted all that much because Tilly and, and Michael are sort of the, the the more obvious pairing there. But I love that she's not afraid to sort of say, well, are you doing this because I'm qualified or because I'm compliant? Which is the big question that should be asked. And he's like, I'm doing it because we all love you, basically. We would all follow you and we all trust you. And she even says, I've never commit, completed the command training. And he's like, what you've been through is way beyond the remit of command <laughs> yeah. training. I think we're fine, you know? So, yeah. And I do love yeah. his rationale. It's it's subtle, but it's there. Because this it bothered me initially the first time I watched it. Um, but I, in rewatching it, I just love when he says something, something to the effect of, you're handling this transition to the future better than most other people. And so I feel like I can trust you to handle this while I figure out who my permanent first officer will be. Yeah, um, completely. Yeah. And so that idea of like, and, and it's so um, indicative of Saru's character that that's what he's looking at of like, basically like, whose mental health was wrecked the least <laughs> in this transition. <laughs> and, the irony um, being that by season four, Tilly's like, I don't even know if I want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It is It is a big, but with everything she goes through with Osira, it, mm -hmm. you know, it yes. makes, it makes sense. So um, it, that, that decision has grown on me, but I was hoping we would chat about it a little bit today. Yeah, I feel the same way. But as I said, you, you kind of already brought it up, but I think it's also good because it puts her in that position where, you get a chance to have Tilly and Osira face off and Mary and Janet as well at that yeah. level. And those scenes are just so blooming good that I'm like, all right, I can forgive you if you are maneuvering her into, you know, being in temporary command so that we had this great face off. Yeah. So yeah, I'll allow uh, it. <laughs> and I do love it because, you know, I mean, maybe, yeah, it doesn't happen now, but when she gets to finally sit in the captain's chair, it just makes me think of the first episode that we see her in context is for Kings where she says, you know, nobody knows this, but I'm going to be captain someday. Um, yeah. So to finally get to see it happen, even if it's just like a temporary 
you know, acting captain while everyone oh. else, while everyone else in charge is off the ship. Um, yeah. It's just really, I think that uh, really the satisfying. whole point though is that the whole point of that was that I think by getting there, she realized it wasn't what she wanted. That's kind yes. of what she says at the start yes. of season four. Yeah, exactly. Was like it, it didn't fulfill my every wish in quite the way, and that's why I love that she literally went from there to teaching, which so many people have done. I was <laughs> right. like, oh, actually, you know, I can impart wisdom to the next generation, and I really yes. hope she's part of that Starfleet Academy series. Yeah, and I'm so <laughs> excited to see her in the season five trailer. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm so, well, everything. yeah, we'll get to see her a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, so I'm going to move to the acting then uh, in terms of anything we haven't really talked about. Uh, so did you guys have anything you wanted to bring up or anyone you wanted to mention in terms of the acting and the performances? Oh, Tara Rosling. <laughs> I am <laughs> obsessed with her. She is such a force when she first comes on the bridge. Um, mm. She's such a good Vulcan, in my opinion. I was very surprised watching this. As I say, I'm currently working my way through season four. So going from where I am now, which was I was I just watched the episode Rubicon, uh, and going from there oh, yeah. back to here, I was surprised how initially sort of cold and angry Tarina comes off because she's yes. so not that by the end of season four. Well, she's in like, love, so <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect? Oh yes, and it's surprising to me that they really do see that from moment one with her and Saru because I was like, when that happened in season four, I was like, oh, that's out of nowhere, but I like it. And then again, watching this episode back, I'm like, actually, they were hinting at that from the moment they met they, yeah. Have, yeah. they have a gorgeous moment of like watching the sunrise over Navarre together yeah. I'm like dang how did I miss this <laughs> yeah, so Tara Rosling is lovely I think she does a great job as Tarina all throughout Discovery season 3 and 4 um, mm -hmm. she's a great Vulcan her outfit is spot on I love her outfit mm, oh, yeah. um, yes. if I had shorter hair I might try it as a cosplay but um... So yeah, you've talked obviously about Tara Rosling. Uh, anybody you wanted to bring up, uh, DK? Uh, no, we've already mentioned uh, Gabrielle, uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's to, for me that's the standout performance in this episode. I don't think there's been a bad performance in this episode, if I'm being mm -hmm. honest. But yeah, she was. A oh, standout I, I agree. Yeah, I don't think there is either. Um, I think as much as I criticise like the the storyline, I think Sonequa Martin Green always brings it, yes. and I I am incredibly grateful that she's like an ambassador for Star Trek and that we have her as the lead of the show, even if sometimes I don't agree with the writing because her performance is always mm -hmm. way up to par. Um, even though my my best moments of her in the episode aren't really the melodramatic stuff so much as the funny moments, like I've mentioned with the whole, uh, you know, oh. Um, I thought you were going to ask to switch beds. That's going to happen. Or oh, whatever you say, number one. <laughs> kind yeah. of moments, you know? <laughs> the little cheeky sort of human things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like that. I think her performance is great. And like I said, her talking herself around in that courtroom scene is, is something I really liked. I love Doug Jones as Saru. I just think it's so great having somebody here who's... It, it basically is unequivocally representing the Federation and Starfleet and all of the Star Trek ideals while everyone else is kind of... Uh, anguished, in. I guess, and uh, torn about it, and he's just like, "No, no, this is why we're great." <laughs> to uh, to Tarina, and like I said, the start of their relationship. <laughs> yeah, and uh, obviously we've mentioned it again already, but Mary Wiseman is fantastic as Tilly. She's just so lovable at all times. Yes, and uh, I've pro probably said this when we've reviewed a different episode of season three or four, but or dead fair as Vance, always fantastic. Yes. Just, again, brilliant bit of casting. I think everyone who joined the show in season three and is still there till the end has been so good. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so we kind of mentioned briefly that this is a first time direction, uh, a first time uh, director. Uh, so what did you think of the direction? Was there anything particularly that stand that stood out? Sorry, <laughs> I'll get my teeth in, uh, in the direction to uh, either of you guys? Nothing, nothing that, you know, particularly ca caught my eye. I mean, it's it just it was a very competently directed mm -hmm. episode, but there's nothing that I would say took my breath away. Okay, I have a couple of notes. I didn't particularly like. Sorry to be critical again. The melodramatic, like slow motion opening as Burnham's talking about how she, you know, doesn't feel as she belongs. But mm -hmm. again, I guess that's uh, it, it's par for the course. Um, but on the other side, I did. I loved the way that the kind of sunlight reflects on the face of Saru and Trina during their scene which is a little thing, but that's something a director would be kind of key for, uh, or, the, you know, lighting people as well. Um, I love when we're dealing with having to do the exposition of talking about who the three quorum members are. We get that great scene of, like, hearing it whilst we're also seeing them on screen um, without it having to delve into, like, suicide squad territory, you know, stopping everything and doing a little bio on screen. 
Um, and I've mentioned it already, but I do love the say yes kind of Spartacus scene, the way it's framed, the way it's like Tilly on high and then everyone sort of saying their bit. I think it's, it's lovely. Um, but on the more critical side, and this isn't the director's fault necessarily, it might be VFX, close the bloody shuttle bit, will you? <laughs> It <laughs> bugs me. This is such a geeky nitpick, but it bugs me no end that Discovery Shuttle Bay has a door that they never blum and use. I know you've got force fields, but they could fail. Just close the door. <laughs> anyway, that epic shot at the end was fantastic. I will say that. I loved you know the way we pan out from Buck's ship to the window to the Shuttle Bay to Discovery. But it shouldn't happen because shut the blum and Shuttle Bay door. Uh, yeah, with that then, we will go to our favourite character moment in line, which is the next part as we start to wrap things up here. Uh, so, Jordan, as the guest, we're going to come to you first. Who was your favorite character in the episode? Oh, I don't have children, but that feels like choosing a favorite child. Um, <laughs> I my favorite character in the episode, I think, is Gabrielle Burnham. Okay, cool. Yep. That's interesting. Th- thank you. <laughs> no, no, but is there is there any reason why? Yeah, I'm. Um, I love seeing her walk that balance between her duty as the um, chassette or the, what is it called? The Shalom Kakai. Um, Which has two names because one of them is Vulcan, one's Romulus. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, walk the, the that duty as a, you know, Kuat Malat member with being Michael's mother. Um hmm which came out as very tough love. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I, I think she does. Yeah. I think it's, she ultimately helps Michael get to where she needs to be emotionally. And yeah. that helps her get the data. Um, hmm. I think it's really like, I mentioned this earlier that, you know, thinking about it in, in terms of when we first meet her and uh, the end, well, mostly in perpetual infinity in season two, um this is the kind of reunion that she wanted with her daughter but couldn't have mm-hmm. back then yeah. and so i i really i really love that um she is learning how to be a parent in a way that she hasn't been a parent since michael was what seven or nine um i don't remember how old michael was when when her parent when she thought her parents died certainly <laughs> earlier than 12. <laughs> right yeah way. yeah and so um yeah i think i think she's she would be my favorite for this for this episode that's cool. I should have said as well, I also do like the way they use the uh, mythology, I guess, that they've created for Picard in terms of the Kawatmalat being bound to lost causes. Yes. So that's how she's kind of trying to tell Michael, like, you're onto a loser here. Oh, that's why I'm here is because this is a lost cause. And at the very end, like, I can't be bound to you anymore. You're you're not a lost cause. Yes, I <laughs> it's love It's really that. sweet as well. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. What about you, DK? Who was your favourite character? Uh, it's going to be another vote for Gabrielle. Oh, wow. Okay. I am surprised by this, but okay. And your reasons? Yeah, you've pretty you've both pretty much just covered them. Uh, I I do love the fact that she was finally getting to be the parent that she could before, and I do like, I do like the co-op Melat aspect that she just started, you know, almost berating Michael <laughs> and the uh, to Cal and Cat just to get her to open up and finally admit the truth. I love that, love that little bit. So yeah, Gabrielle. Okay. I also, um, not to interject, but I also love earlier on in the episode when Michael, you know, Gabrielle says, oh, you seem lost or whatever. Um, and Michael's like, oh, is this the famous absolute candor that I've heard about? And she was like, actually, <laughs> I was being nice. Um, that was, yeah, that was, no, she says something like, uh, you seem like you're between places. Oh, that's right. This, must, that's this right. must be that absolute candor you're talking about. Actually, that was my polite way of saying you seem completely <laughs> lost. Exactly. I love that so much. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great line. Um, my, I'm going to have to be different. My my favourite character was Saru, I have to say, uh, because as I uh, kind of already said, he represents the Trek ideals. There's some great scenes of him bonding with Trina uh, and, and talking about the sort of nature of the Federation. And it's just awesome to see him acting like a captain and, and kind of pulling it off brilliantly, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was what I went with. Uh, so what was your favourite scene or moment, Jordan, in this episode? Um... I think when Michael rescinds her request, um, mm. you know, she kind of at the tail end of her finally being honest with herself. Um, I think when it, it starts with, for me, that my favorite part starts with her mom. I don't remember the specific question that she asked, but then 
Michael just, you know, gets, she has tears in her eyes and just says like, oh, I think Gabrielle asked her, so why are you struggling with if you belong here or not? And Mm. Michael says, I don't know. That's so relatable to me (laughs) in, in different things that I, um, you know, I've experienced. And um, so then to kind of see her kind of externally process her own fears and her own thoughts and emotions and what she's been through and then kind of realize, you know, I don't want, when she says, you know, I don't want Navarre to be, Navarre's peace to be another casualty of the burn. I rescind my request and she walks away. And that's just, it's, a, it's just so powerful to me, um, mm-hmm. that moment. Yeah, I can't disagree. <laughs> Good choice. Um, and what about you, DK? Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go for the, uh, to Callan Cat, uh, this, uh, particularly the, uh, the bit where Gabrielle is pulling Michael up. I, I, I like that a little okay. bit. Um, I nearly went with something similar, but it would seem redundant because you guys have kind of picked the same thing. So I do <laughs> like, I will say, um, I, it was a very close second, but I do like the scene where, like you said, basically it's Burnham talking herself around when she she's getting prodded by Gabrielle in what seems really harsh ways. And she's like, no, I'm still committed to Starfleet and to the Federation. I don't know why I'm, I'm lost. Maybe it's because the stakes are so much higher now. And if I fail, it's going to be... A much bigger you know failure i guess so i did like that a lot but my favorite scene i have to say was still the say yes scene at the end mm. just because it's it's touching and heartwarming and it's even funny at the end so that's why i went with that mm. um and do you have a favorite line jordan that you can remember and quote back oh no i here let me look at my notes i wrote stuff down when i rewatched it mm. i have mine written down i have to say and it is a burnham line despite all my criticism <laughs> I've, I've got mine written down yeah well then you guys go ahead i have to read okay. my notes <laughs> no problem, TK. Do you want to go first then? Yep. So I may question and I may fear because the problems often seem insurmountable. But haven't we always risen to meet them? Mm. Nice. Very yeah. good. Very good. Uh, mine is a, another burn of mine. And it is, Spock believed that together you could create something bigger than yourselves. That's what this quorum is. That's what Navarre is. That's what the Federation is. Oh, I got chills. I got chills, Mike. <laughs> That's just my performance. I thought it was oh, like, here. Oh, and the Oscar goes too. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, I can put it next to the Razzies I've been getting. Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, jokes. No, I love that. Anytime you, you reference Spock or the Federation, you've got me on board. You reference them both in the same sort of paragraph. Gee, there, I'm there. <laughs> Have you found it yet then, Jordan? Yeah, so can I have two? By all means, yeah, go for it. I mean, I am a Discovery super fan, so I feel like I should be allowed to have two in this review. Um, (laughs) I've done it before, to be fair. I was going to say, that's the rule I just made up for myself. So um, (laughs) the first one is definitely in line with what you, this is why I ask for two, um, with what you guys have been saying. I love when Vakir asks, or Vakir makes the statement, we don't know how if or how Spock understood love. And Michael says, I think I know. Um, Mm. I think that was really, really moving. But I also love what she says before that, where, um, you know, Tarina says, you know, Spock left the Federation. And she says, you know, that doesn't mean he didn't love it. And it doesn't mean he wouldn't return someday. I should have mentioned that. I love that. Yes, I love that part. Um, so and and that's, a, to... that's a continuation of, you know, your favorite quotes as well. So they all yeah, kind of I have to together. chime in here and say that I completely forgot it, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pull a Jordan on this and also say <laughs> that I have to shout, I have to shout out the uh, interchange when they first get to Navarre, when um, Tarina says, I wish Spock could see the fruits of his labor like you are now. And Burnham just mm. replies, I'm sure he would find it all utterly fascinating. Yes. <laughs> it's just, oh, so brilliant. It yeah. is. Um, and then for a little bit of diversity, because we all kind of have the same type of quotes. Um, I also really loved, and we've talked a lot about Gabrielle's blunt honesty with Michael, but I feel like at the beginning of the episode, Tilly was also very blunt and honest. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I love when, you know, Michael says, um, I didn't tell you because then, you know, that could get, I didn't tell you I was going to go off on this unsanctioned mission because that could get you in trouble. I didn't want you to have to report it. And, you know, Tilly says, no, that. It should have been my choice, whether or not my choice, not yours. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I just, I love, I love Tilly's honesty with Michael that like, Hey, you messed up. And that put a lot, that put a lot of strain on a lot of people. 
including yeah. me, your best friend. Um, and so I just I love I that love... Cause it's it's such a growth from the Tilly of like when she yes. first met Michael as well. Yeah, she stands up to her at the start of this episode with you put me in a hopeless position with Saru and the Admiral. Yes, yeah, it's great to see her sticking up for herself. And again, it kind of goes towards you can see why she's leaning towards Saru thinking, yeah, she'd be a fine first officer. Yeah, anyway. exactly. So um, that was my that's my runner up. Is is that entertaining? Ooh. I'm glad you're here because that way we haven't missed anything I wanted to talk about that we would have probably done. So, um, so this is a big question, but um, what was the message that you took away from the episode overall, if if there was one? Um, DK, I'm going to come to you because you knew to expect this probably more than Jordan did. Yeah, uh, be true to yourself. Well, that's just an evergreen message, <laughs> but okay. Um, Not in the circles I, I, think... I go in, my... <laughs> uh, I I think it was more about, for me, just because something is bigger than you doesn't mean you should be overwhelmed or doubt yourself. Which again, <laughs> kind of ironic given my criticisms, but I think that was kind of what it was getting at. Um, and what about you, Jordan? Do you have a, a sort of takeaway from this? Um, I, I have a lot. It's hard to, I wasn't expecting this question, so I don't have it put into words. Be honest with yourself mm-hmm. as best you can be. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes that I, sometimes that takes other people helping you be on like see your blind yeah. spots. Yeah, that's I think that literally all three of these kind of feed together into one uh, <laughs> yeah, one exactly. point, which is I think we've all took the same thing away, which show, goes to show. I mean, you could have said this is in a very real way. This is very much uh, infinite diversity and infinite combinations because of the whole reunification thing. But mm-hmm. uh, that was more background, I think, than what you were supposed to take away from it. So. Cool. Uh, Before we get to our conclusions and score, then we are going to go to our usual audience response section, uh, the section that I geekily call subspace communications. Incoming transmission. And we don't have as much as we have had in previous weeks this week. uh, So I've given our guest a chance to to have a week off and not have to read any of it out. So it'll just be myself and DK's voices you have to put up with. Uh, So DK, do you want to start us off? Do you have, uh, I think it's all from the same Facebook group that you have. Yeah, Star Trek uh, family. Uh, Yeah. I'll start off with uh, Jen Souza Lavario. I thought it was a good episode. I loved the clip from Unification 2 and the mention of Picard and his personal archives. It was also funny to see Romulans being the open-minded and welcoming ones while the Vulcans were more isolationist and paranoid. Still not sure I can call Vulcan Navarro though. <laughs> Lind Anderson Murdoch says I liked it very much, while Om Alexander says my favourite episode of Discovery, five stars. Margie Blaker simply says, I love it. And Veronique, uh, excuse me, and Veronique Menunia says, uh, five, liked it. Chris Murphy says the Spock scene was nice and name dropping Picard. But to be honest, I don't remember much else about it. Andrew uh, Gangsos says, three out of five, lots of great moments, but a couple shoehorned bits like Michael's mother being in the co-op Millat. It felt like the writers were trying too hard to make things from other series fit in. Fit in. It's probably my favourite episode of the season, though. Uh, Paul R. Faulkner says, Seeing the hologram of Nimoy's Spock made me openly weep. After his Spock passing in the Kelvin universe and the passing of Nimoy himself, I never thought we'd see his Spock again. Yeah, that I, yeah, that was a sentiment shared in this house also. Uh, Phil Duff says five out of five for the insanely good use of the Nimoy clip from Unification and the sentimentality of it being Burnham learning what became of her brother, plus the literal tie of Peck and Nimoy. Uh, Laura Jodice says five. I especially love what Burnham learned from the process. Sarah Davis says I didn't realise it was a follow on episode at the time I saw it. Paul Spencer says, from what I can recall, a three star for me. The Nimoy cameo was very well chosen and the discourse mature, but it felt a little static and enclosed as a bottle show. Something uh, Jordan referred to earlier. Uh, Ross Basin says, as with all things Discovery, I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. And finally, Tyler Weddle says, I think I only take issue with the notion that only Burnham could go to Navarre. The Vulcans putting political pride ahead of obviously flawed logic, and then in parentheses they thought they were responsible for the burn, and we have proof they were not, was very out of character. Someone else should have been able to figure this out and prove it before Michael. If I attempt to reconcile this, it means we have very different Vulcans, and we do, but it jarred me. Does that make it wrong? Bad move? Out of character? I concede that no, not really. It means that it's been 900 years and a lot can change. And it is supposed to be jarring. 
I'm still over it now, but the memory is still fresh. Yeah, so in terms of the feedback that I've got, this is from the Star Trek Strange New Worlds Facebook group. Jeremy Giller says, not near as good as it could have been. Episode concentrated on Burnham and her space monk mother more than the law and wasn't all that compelling. Okay. Uh, Louis Angel Rosario uh, just says four out of five. John McNeese says eight, which I assume is out of ten, despite me always asking if you want to rate it out of five. Uh, Alex Miller says three out of five. To be honest, I hated that her mom showed up there. It made so little sense. Also, it would have been better if they showed what Navarre society was like instead of describing it in a few sentences. This episode addressed a huge bit of law but didn't seem to do it the justice it deserved. The continuity with the unification storyline was nice to see, as was the importance Spock had on Navarre. I also loved the president and the Vulcans would have a ritual form of debate. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. From the Final Frontier a Star Trek fan club page, Jeff Sykes says zero. Burnham's mom just happened to be at the centre of it was lame. All right. Totally fair, balanced view there. It's Star- certainly a take. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Again, from Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Terry Siders Burger gives it five. Jose Luis Verta gives it five. Philip Silva says ten stars. Rob Upton says three out of five. Mark Poulis also says five. Uh, from the group Doctor Who and Star Trek Trekkies, Trekkers, and Whovians Unite, Sarah Baker gives it five stars. Uh, over from our Blue Sky, Sky at Sky Vaz Normandy says, it's not bad, but in desperate need of more world building. The biggest problem I've always had with Disco is it absolutely sucks at this. That's why a lot of people feel like it doesn't fit. The writing relies too heavily on inferences or one-off lines for its world building. You don't need to say a lot, but they don't say enough. Uh, And Aaron Bossig replies, you could argue that TOS has aspects of this too. Way too many references not fully fleshed out. The difference is in the 60s, that was the way things were done. By Discovery, we knew better in regards to the the whole world building stuff. Uh, And finally, from the Hit or Miss Star Trek Instagram page, just a couple of scores. Twin Cities Trekkies Pod gives it four and Geocorn gives it three and a half. So I think mainly quite positive, actually, considering, especially for a Discovery episode. So... Yeah, other than the one really hot take. Um, so, yeah, all that uh, remains then is for us to give our conclusions and our score, excuse me, out of five Starfleet Deltas for the episode. That's fine. Analysis. Um, do you guys mind if I start? Because I feel like I'm going to be the more negative, so that way I get it out of the way. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, this was my conclusion. I will say I've kind of come around a bit more, and I, I kind of hoped I wouldn't have the more we've discussed it. So I've appreciated this discussion and I really liked this episode. Hopefully the listeners will have as well. Um, But the conclusion that I wrote yesterday was uh, a frustrating episode for me at times. I feel like the Burnham doesn't feel she belongs. Stuff was already really played out and I get kind of annoyed that she gets away with breaking rules, fails upwards and lands in the captain's chair as a result. That said, I appreciate the deeper examination of that journey afforded by episodes like this, even if I don't agree with the specifics. It's hard to view this as an individual episode because like much of Discovery, there's an overriding season arc in play that's a shame as i would really love to have explored more of the reunification of navarre its struggles which are only hinted at how they got here etc dragging in the co-op a lot from picard feels like it was an excuse to have gabrielle act like a jerk and get away with it under the absolute candor rule though sonia so acts these scenes just about well enough to save them the title feels almost misleading in how little we see of the actual unification but as i said i appreciated what we did get and the use of the clip from of spock from part two is inspired and emotional providing the needed link i enjoyed this episode but i didn't love it there was too much focus on things i wasn't interested in and not enough on things i was there was a bit of a feeling of treading water on the burn story and i could see a lot of people's criticisms of the show in play for example burnham's messiah complex and special status over dramatic moments too much reliance on the season arc etc On the plus side, I think the episode uses Discovery's time displacement perfectly. The acting was outstanding. It was great seeing the crew interaction moments, and there was just enough Trek sentiment for me to put this over the edge into a slight hit, and I give it three out of five. So, uh, DK, I'm going to come to you next so that we can have Jordan uh, end us with hopefully a high. So what was your conclusion in score? No worries. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I've seen this one since its initial broadcast, and I'm always unsure going into these things whether they'll hold up. For me, this does. The SB-19 and the Tikalin Cat are fascinating to me in this, as are the Co-op Milat, much more so in my opinion than their appearance in Picard. I'm uh, I'm not too pig-headed to admit I'm wrong on the Romulans, and so far, so far mind you, for the most part I have to admit I'm starting to be won over and this is one of the episodes that does that. 
The writing on this one is to me exemplary, with many references to parts 1 and 2 of the trilogy, as well as the main arc of Discovery, together with an enthralling and emotional subplot featuring Tilly's decision-making uh, process on the first officer position. However, the writing alone wouldn't be able to carry this without good performances, and the performances in this episode are outstanding. Of course, this iteration of Star Trek is different. The situation, 1,000 years on, demands it, as do the emotional stakes, and Sonequa Martin-Green sells me on that 100%. Couple that with a clip of Nimoy from Unification Part 2 in this, and I'm in. And I'm giving it 4 out of 5. Okay, cool. Uh, go on then, Jordan, take us home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I Spoiler, giving it five out of five. Um, I mentioned at the okay. beginning that this is my one of my favorite Discovery episodes and one of my favorite Trek episodes of all time. I love a good courtroom drama, and I think this is one of the best of the best. I think that one thing I love about Discovery is the character moments that we get, the, the quieter moments where they can express um, their, their inner thoughts, um, what they're going through and we can see where they are in their character arc. And I think that this is, I mentioned it before, a really pivotal place in Burnham's journey. Um, I think that this is one thing about season three that I love that we haven't really talked about is um, you get to see, you know, Michael in season one questioning herself, but in season three questioning the Federation. And I think that she needed that. And this is, this is where the end of that questioning happens on her route to the captain's chair. And I love it. Love Gabrielle Burnham. Love Saru. Um, love getting to see Spock again. Leonard Nimoy <laughs> Spock again. So it's a strong five out of five for me. Awesome. I can't believe I just felt the need to uh, do the actual maths on this when I could have just looked <laughs> and told you that with, with scores of three, <laughs> four, and five, naturally the average and the final score for Discovery's Unification is 3 Five. Four out of five. No. <laughs> Which I ironically tried. means DK, I... you hit the exact final score bang on by being in the middle there. Well, you've either got it or you haven't, mate. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I've really enjoyed this episode. I always love having Jordan on, especially to talk about Discovery. And I've I've really enjoyed the discussion. Hopefully everyone doesn't feel like I've been too negative. No, um, not at all. Yeah. I've been able to just sit back and listen to, to you two guys on this one, and I've really enjoyed it. Cool. Well, hopefully the audience feels the same way. So, yeah, again, I, I couldn't do this on my own. So thanks again, Jordan, for agreeing to come on again. Anytime. Absolutely. Awesome. We, I'll, I'm going to take you up on that. So you shouldn't say that because then I'll be I'll be messaging you constantly being like, come on again. There's another I, and if I'm available, I'll do it. So oh, I've got you down for a few, I think, at least a yes. couple more. Yeah, you'll uh, get to see me or hear me, I guess, a couple more times. Awesome. And uh, yeah, congrats and good luck on uh, when Trek Long Island comes up. I'm so excited to see you, you, you know, by proxy and to see your cosplays. Yeah, so. thank you. I'm very excited. I hope they come together. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they will. Your uh, your Detmer and everything that I saw. Did you also do uh, Relic? I think I, did. I saw I did as well. President Relic, yeah. yes. I thought so. Yeah, they were both fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have anywhere that the people can find you on the internet that you wanted to shout out? Yeah, I'm Jordan LaForden on most platforms, um, on Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Instagram, and YouTube are, are the, the main places to find me. You have a YouTube channel? I do. Ooh, I didn't know that. I I'll mostly just that. make, I make fan vids, so like music videos with Star Trek scenes That's in cool. the background. Um, I so wish can, I could do that. I love that kind of thing. I, I that I watched so many of those when I, you know, was younger, and then I was like, why don't I just make my own? And so, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I have. Am... They're mostly discovery focused. So I have, you know, mm. Ash and Michael. I have um, <laughs> a, a Detmer and Owo one, um, but there is one that um, Maurice from, you know, we're friends on Mastodon. He's been on the podcast yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, he requested a Ortegas versus Detmer flying the ship piloting the oh, ship. Cool. so i made one of those as well so yeah jordan laforden on youtube i really want to <laughs> do uh, i really want to work on a saru and tarina one before season five so we'll see if i can find mm. the right song for them Ooh. uh answers in the comments if you can think yes. of one that might be yes. appropriate give me some inspiration i haven't found the right song for those two awesome cool uh, so what about you dk I, I i ask this every week and i always get the same answer is there anywhere that why, can do find you even, you? why do you even bother <laughs> I, no, <laughs> just no. Fair enough. Well, 
start making something up and say something different every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are watching on YouTube, I've come up with a handy new graphic of where you can find the podcast and me. Uh, so suffice to say, we are on YouTube under Hit or Miss Star Trek, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts as Silver Screen Podcast slash Hit or Miss Star Trek Podcasts. We're on Facebook groups as Hit or Miss Star Trek, Instagram as, that is way too small for me to see, H-O-M Star Trek Pods, I think. <laughs> H-O-M see, Star Trek should... Podcast. This is why I should have it up. H-O-M Star Trek Podcast, that's right. Yep. Uh, Mastodon, we are at H-O-M Trek at mstdn.social. Uh, Threads is just my personal account, which also doubles as the podcast, so it's michael.k.wilson. Blue Sky, likewise, is at mikepods.bsky.social. And the artist formerly known as Twitter, we are at Trek Screen Pods with a capital T, S, and P. So hopefully you've all noted that down. Do get in touch with us. As I say, the, uh, the podcasts are always looking for new community and a new uh, you know new members and new interactions and we are we are quite you know quite nice for the most part as jordan will attest i'm sure <laughs> so yes next week we're going to be reviewing the deep space nine episode visionary so stay tuned for some classic o'brien must suffer action and uh, yeah <laughs> if, uh, if you aren't already aware or you haven't heard our little advert you can also follow us on our sister podcast silver screen podcast uh, where i've just launched a cinema classics sub uh, subcategory uh, we looked at Casablanca for our first episode. You've always got DK's cult classics coming out quite regularly now on those and Silver Screen itself, the, the main podcast. So if you're into film as well as Star Trek, check those out. Uh, we will be doing a Star Trek Nemesis space crossover, I think, soon. And uh, yeah, uh, so just remains for me to say thanks again, everyone. And DK, do you want to shout us out with our usual uh, closing? Okay. Remember, we are Starfleet. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. You have been listening to the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast, hosted by Michael Wilson and DK. Produced and edited by Mike Wilson. Additional material by DK. Please remember to like this episode and spread it throughout subspace. Subscribe to the Hit or Miss YouTube channel and follow us online. Links to all of our social media pages can be found via the link tree listed in the episode's description. For any queries or to apply to be a guest on the show, you can also email HOMStarTrek at gmail.com. This podcast is part of the Mike's Podcasts Network. You can listen to this and our sister podcasts on all good podcast providers by searching for Mike's Podcasts. Hit or Miss Podcast was based on an idea by Michael Wilson and Will Templer. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll be back, but for now, hailing frequencies closed. I'm gonna warp out of here at once, maximum speed.